So we actually have a variety of programs uh, for the eSports Association. One is career readiness. So we actually work with the Career Center here to better prepare our association members to learn those life skills that they are going to need so that when they make that transition over to a career pathway. Awesome, awesome. This guy, this guy, we got to turn around. This guy wins almost every tournament we throw. I'm telling you, you got to watch the live. CSUDH Esports Association is centered in four domains, academics and research, community engagement, competition, and entertainment. We're trying to make sure that the students are prepared for the future, that they understand the diversity that media offers now, and again, look beyond the traditional outlets. They can gain fieldwork, partnerships, as well as potential job opportunities, and in both the higher education and, and K-12 fields, we believe that esports is a strategy and not an outcome. Our association is here to help anyone that is willing to learn how to take your gaming skills to the next level through a supporting community. If you are looking to showcase your production talents to help support our esports teams, then this is the association for you. We host online and on site tournaments that will allow our members to showcase their competitive spirit. Our association broadcasts out our competition and practices to entertain our community as well as our global audience. We believe that by joining us, you will come out of the association feeling transformed and better prepared to transfer your skills into your career. Join today and begin to explore endless opportunities through our eSports Association here at Cal State Dominguez Hills. Welcome everyone to another esports talk session. Um, I am super thrilled and happy and excited and all the above <laughs> to introduce our special guest. Um, but before I do that, I just want to quickly interject with um, an announcement, and that is uh, thank you, those that are tuning in to watch this live, and for those that will be watching this on post. Uh, we can't do this without you, and also just to reiterate that we do have various social outlets uh, down below in our channel. Uh, feel free to give us a follow, a like, a comment. All of that helps us uh, thrive as we continue this programming. All right, without any further ado, today's topic is exploring possibilities in gaming. Uh, and with us today, we have Laura Coleman. Uh, Laura, welcome. Thanks, good to be here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Laura, if you don't mind, just uh, share with us, uh, since you are no stranger, uh, your field of study, uh, and what is it that you do? Yeah, so I am currently a master's candidate or master's student um, in my second year of prosthetics and orthotics. So what prosthetics and orthotics are, as a very thing, uh, prosthetics is for people who have any kind of um, limb deformation or if they're completely missing a limb due to trauma or anything else. Um, we basically provide them with a limb to be able to walk or be able to hold things again, depending on what limb that they're missing. Um, orthotics is basically just bracing people for different kinds of things. So if you have hand weakness, we have different or orthoses is what we call them. Orthoses that will go on your hand that will help you be able to grab things. If you have a lower limb problem, something wrong with your leg, some kind of weakness in your leg, then we can put some, some kind of brace on there to make it easier to walk. Excellent, excellent. Gosh, thank you for breaking that down for us. And, and um, share with us a little bit. I know you're uh, a Toro through and through, um, but did you um, take your undergrad study with us? I did not. So, so I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I went to a super, super small liberal arts college uh, down in Southern Indiana. We had a total of, I think, 1,200 kids total on wow. our campus. That's all for 
uh, <laughs> classes combined. Um, <laughs> so um, I got my undergrad over there in kinesiology and physiology, which is again, more big words, um, but it basically just boils down to basically health sciences, how the body works and how it moves. Mm. Um, and then I ended up applying for prosthetics and orthotics and there are only 13 schools in the nation who offer the program in general. So um, I ended up getting accepted to a few of them, but ended up picking Cal State because where else would I ever want to go? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I moved hey, uh, 1,200 cool. miles across the country with a trailer in tow and, <laughs> and got all of that. <laughs> started my degree. <laughs> How cool. So I'm currently what? in my second year um, yeah. and I'm currently looking for residencies. Very cool. Here. Very cool. And um, share a little bit about the program um, and, and your experience um, overall. So the experience has been a roller coaster, absolute roller coaster. It's been amazing, but it's definitely been a roller coaster. Um, so uh, we start we started classes going in eight hours a day, like a normal work day. We'd get there at eight a.m. We'd leave at five. Um, first semester was basically just lecturing. Right. You have to get all the book smart stuff down before you can actually understand the materials that you're going to be working with. So, um, yeah, I'd be there for eight or nine hours a day and um, just learning everything. We kind of jumped around from different topic to different topic, depending on how it worked best for the instructor's schedule. Um, did a bunch of lecturing the first semester bunch of lecturing in the second semester, then of course COVID hit <laughs> right, right in the middle of one of our uh, classes. So unfortunately we had to go online. You know, I assume you had the same thing at main campus because we are a satellite location. We're not based out of the main campus. We are in uh, Los Alamitos, California. So I think that's about 30 minutes away from main yeah, campus. Correct. Um, but yeah, so we had to transition to online classes, which wasn't the best for everybody. I actually started learning better that way just being able to digest the material at a slower rate rather than having it all bombarded at me at once. Right. So it actually ended up working out very well for myself. Um, and we're luckily able to be in class again this semester. Um, we only do lab work. Uh, all of our lectures are mainly online. Okay, so very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And, and, um, and then just give us a little bit of background to like your experience in gaming. Like what was your introduction, if you will, uh, to, to uh, <laughs> games? <laughs> so my introduction, uh, I had a, I think I had the original PlayStation way back in the day. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> um, the moment I actually like, really started getting into gaming was, uh, my brother ended up buying, I think a PS, it was a PS2. Yep. Um, and then I ended up really getting into Call of Duty games, um, all of them, we'll just say that, but mainly <laughs> Black Ops 2, Black Ops 3, nice. those are probably my top two. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, I started school, started kind of hanging by the wayside, and then um, now I'm here, I continued playing, and then I started picking up other games like Minecraft, yeah. because it's just a very, I just need something calming right, right, after, right. after really to, to keep you days. at ease and centered. <laughs> so I picked up, yeah, I picked up um, Minecraft okay. Sims because you know, Sims yes. is always really great. Yes, <laughs> um, and then Fortnite. Fortnite's my main one right now. Oh, nice, really nice, nice. Very cool. Very <laughs> cool. That's awesome, Laura. I mean, yeah, it's so true, you know, with the, the balancing act, right? Especially to find a space to kind of de-stress and find oh, that absolutely. into gaming. And right, there's certain game titles that, yes, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll get the adrenaline going and some that will just like soothe you. It's like a calm tea. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's got to get your thoughts together. But um, like that nighttime tea. <laughs> yeah, that sleepy time tea when, you know, yeah. you just wind down. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh man, I, I never really thought about comparing games to like tea, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> that comparison just is like settling right now in my head. Um, so, so for those who can relate, you know, feel free to chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, continuing on, I mean, you're studying, you're actually in the field, you're in your second year, um, you're helping the process. Uh, if, if you could share a little bit about like, 
what does it look like in the field and how does one really get into those spaces of recovery, if you will? So it's kind of, that's a kind of a hard question to answer just because it's very broad and our right. field also very broad. We cover a lot of different, um, mm -hmm. different pathologies or diseases, um, right. anything from diseases to just having an amputation due to some kind of traumatic event that happened. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, where does it start? If, you, if you're talking about an amputation, that's right. probably we start right when they either plan to have the amputation if it is planned so if they have some kind of cancer growing in one of their joints if they know that an amputation is coming up then we like to try to get to them as soon as possible and talk to them about their options what we can offer them if they're even interested in getting any kind of device because some people actually don't want a device if you have if you have somebody who has an amputation right at the wrist right here right they might just be okay with that. And they, they kind of make life work and, um, other people, they would prefer to have some kind of device that will help them at work. So it all kind of depends on each individual person and what their, what their goals are in their life. Um, right. but if we're talking about upper, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I think Laura, like you're absolutely right. It, it, it really becomes, you know, on a case by case basis uh, with every patient in mind and thinking what's going to be best, but giving them those options. But I, I think you explained it at one point, um, you know, the, the sort of the process, right? It goes from the amputation to then moving into the design of the actual prosthetic and then moving into the, um, uh, the therapy, the recovery, the ability to now function with, with, um, you know, a prosthetic and, and getting them into that space that's going to essentially help them, um, you know, mobilize and heal. Um, so share with us, uh, what it is that you've been studying. Are you more in the field of the design of the prosthetics? Is that really your space, uh, that you are, um, studying more in depth? So yes and no. Um, we, we're kind of the middle ground between, um, we do, some, you do have some prosthetists slash orthotists um, who will design different devices for people, but you also have like biomedical engineers who will also come up with different ideas. The good thing about us providing different concepts is that we understand all the different um, pressure sensitive versus pressure tolerant areas of different parts of the body. So we have a better fully rounded experience in that. Um, so yes, we will design some of them. A lot of them are already kind of designed for us through the bigger companies such as Autobach or Oser. Um, and then we are also the middle ground for therapy as well. So whenever we provide a device to somebody, we'll give it to them, but we also train them a little bit. Now we are by no means physical therapists or occupational therapists. <laughs> Just right, right, right. Let that be known. Um, <laughs> good to know the difference but, too. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I wouldn't have known if you didn't share. Thank you. Yeah. So we just we'll give them a little bit of um guidance of how to use their leg or how to use their new arm that they just got. Um, because there is a learning curve to it. Right. But along with that, we usually do suggest to have the patient go to physical therapy or occupational therapy, just so they're really getting the best use out of their device and being able to have the best outcomes in the future. Right. Excellent. Excellent. And, and um, so sh share with us, like, uh, you know, I know there's, you know, organizations that are starting to look into how they can fuse, um, you know, some of you know, hey, you know, getting your limb, you know, removed, I'm sure is not uh, a pleasant experience, right? By no means yet mm -hmm. having to talk to patients, having to, um, you know, really go through that process. Um, I mean, just share with us, how do you guys prepare, you know, mentally uh, to deliver some of that news? And then, you know, at the same time, give them that hope and inspiration that is needed. Luckily, we're not the first per people to be telling them that they're going to have to have an amputation. So that's kind of a good thing coming from our mm. field. Um, by the time that we talk to them, they've already made the decision that they are going to have an amputation or they've already had it if it was due to trauma. Um, 
so the good thing is whenever we're stepping in we're kind of the the shining light at the end of the tunnel yeah, like yeah. we we are going to be able to get you back to what your normal self should be like of course it's probably not going to be completely normal but you're going to come up with a new normal hmm. um so we we like to talk to them and be able to we have to the best thing is to be able to relate to somebody and be able to understand going back to what their goals are you know if you have somebody who's who just lost a hand and they work in construction you know we're of course going to give them something that's going to be able to get them back to their job and be able to do what they want to do in the end um but if you have somebody who, let's say, works just behind a desk, they they do computer work all day, then we can provide them with something different. If you know, if you if we want something, if they're after something that, um, they want to have like wholesomeness back again, like they feel like they're really missing a piece of themselves, right, we right. can get them a silicone mm. arm that looks exactly like their other arm. Wow. And then. So it all just depends on exactly what that person is after, but we're always, I feel like we're usually that shining light at the end of the tunnel. Like we, we're here for you. We're here to help you and give you what's going to make you happy in the long run. Amazing. So it's a lot about that dialogue, just going back and forth and talking about what you, exactly what you're after. Like what is going to make you feel like the best self again. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so is there a lot of like, let's say, like you said, that dialogue is important to have uh, with the patient to to basically get that response. Mm -hmm. um, so is much of that dialogue something that you're initiating more so, or is that something that it's just, you hear it more from patients? Uh, what has been your overall experience that you've noticed? So it kind of goes back and forth again, <laughs> depending mm -hmm. on the person. Mm -hmm. um, you have some people who will come in and they're like, oh, look at this. I found this really cool robotic arm. It looks so cool. It's going to be able to do all these cool things. Right, right. And and, th and then those people are like ex super excited to get their device. Yeah. yeah. And then you have other people who are a little bit more reserved and you have to maybe like, of course, they're scared. Like you said, if you, if you have to make a decision to amputate a part of your body, that's no easy decision. No. Yeah. Even, I mean... They're crazy stories, but, <laughs> right, right, but right. it is absolutely no easy decision. So some people will come in and they're just really nervous. They're scared. Or some people frankly come in embarrassed, which mm. is absolutely, I mean, I think it's absolutely incredible to think that way. I, I can't imagine thinking that way, but the good thing is we can provide them with that sense of security. Again, we can, you know, if you, if you don't want to be looked at like the person with the robot arm, then we can provide them something with that kind of like that silicone hand I was telling you about right. that gives them that comfort back. Gotcha. Gotcha. And, and, and just to allude a little bit about that, like robotic arm, you know, and, and mm -hmm. something that, you know, even that I stumbled upon, even just in my research and reading is, uh, you know, some of that excitement I'm sure comes from maybe a visualization, right. From a, from a video game, from a movie, perhaps something mm -hmm. that media just, populated to showcase hey it can look very fashionable <laughs> right <laughs> it can look pretty rad and pretty cool and pretty amazing and think about all the possibilities now that you have a robotic arm that can probably lift more than what you typically could have in the past um so yeah sorry i'm, I'm throwing it out there just because in, in some of the research that i've been doing i've i've noticed and stumbled upon some of the inspirations why that becomes a thing now and, and it hopefully brings a little bit more acceptance to understanding this is another not the end but another chapter another stage that i'm moving into in life and um right i'm sure that you know when you have you know patients that go about it that way um I'm sure it makes it a little bit more easier to dialogue but again, it, it, everybody to each their own it's a different case like you said and thank you for sharing right. that because it's I'm sure it's no easy feat, you know, mentally to kind yeah. of accept and move. Um, and it's definitely interesting. I actually just gave a presentation on, um, we called it aesthetic prosthetics. So basically uh, um, I talked about how different cultures viewed, um, view cosmetics um, regarding prosthetics. So in Asian cultures, you'll usually have people wanting that highly super realistic silicone look, whereas the USA, 
kind of embraces the disability now and they have more, they, they kind of take their disability and make it their new positive identity. And they're like, look how cool this is. Like, it's not the best thing in the world that's ever happened to me, but like, let's make the best, the best out of what we have. Yeah. No, gosh, that's really interesting, Laura. And, and such a good point you brought in culture, um, because you're right. Uh, it's not the same everywhere else. And like you said, a, a disability prior to even where we're at in the technologies today in prosthetics, you're right. You know, we didn't have this warm embrace, if you will, that it feels like now and, and even more so in the future is what I foresee, hopefully, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, that, that right there, again, has a lot to do with, I'm sure, the psyche of someone having to accept that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and just, you know, some of the stuff that I've been, you know, just kicking around some ideas and ideating with you uh, with what some of these great organizations have been doing, um, you know, there, there's one uh, nonprofit out in Florida uh, called Limitless, right? I love that play on words. Um, mm -hmm. And what they're doing is really creating these prosthetics, right, to make it look very aesthetic to mm -hmm. someone's interest, um, whether it's gaming or something in pop culture, what have you. Um, they're able to do that, especially helping kids uh, that are having to now deal with that. Um, and so uh, that, is that something that you foresee more, um, you know, establishing more, you know, not, not to say that we're hoping for this to happen, but to have a response into that field to know, hey, we can now focus on different types of designs knowing that we have functionality in mind, number one. Um, and, and I guess just to ask, because you're the person that I would ask for, for advice on this, it's like, what, what, what kind of um, other stages is important other than the functionality before you get to the aesthetic look, if you will? So functionality is honestly probably the main one. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, we're kind of in a weird shift right now in our field because we start out with, um, people, people, people would get into prosthetics and they wouldn't have any kind of degree. They would have a high school education and then it moved up to a certification. And I think it was maybe two years, a two year certification. Um, and then it moved up to a bachelor program and now we're at a master's level and they're even talking about making a doctorate degree in wow. the future. So we're at this really weird kind of middle ground in our mm. field. So, um, what I've personally experienced going into different clinics is a lot, it, a lot of the older practitioners tend to really focus on functionality, which of course is extremely, extremely important because if it doesn't work, then the person's just going to throw it in their closet and they're never going to use it. Hmm. Now, actually part of that presentation, I was just telling you about, about the aesthetics prosthetics. Um, we're definitely starting to get into how to make, devices more personable um and how to because it's not just a device to make you function yes that's a major part of it but this is now a part of their body so why are we not focusing more on what this looks like and why are we not more interested in what the person is actually wanting in the long run mm, so um yeah I, I mean you brought up um limitless and them doing different designs for, um, for kids. I, I was actually following, I, I follow this girl on Instagram who has, I think I'm pretty sure it's a, uh, it's an Iron Man leg. If I remember correctly, no I haven't seen her post anything for a while, but it's an Iron Man leg. It has, you know, the, the circle in the middle and everything. And oh, it, it's God. amazing because yeah. you can scroll back through her post to when she didn't have that. And it was just a normal leg, like a normal, what we would consider a normal uh, right. prosthetic leg right and you know she still embraced having having that device but it it was a completely new person when she got her iron man leg because she thought it was so cool she loved showing it to people of course kids loved it like you said right. kids absolutely love it it's just amazing how much morality goes up when mm -hmm. when you give them something that really actually feels like a part of their body and is actually part of who they want to be perceived as 
Right, right on. Gosh, thank you for sharing, Laura. And, and, and just to add to that, it's, it's so, I mean, without that depiction, let's say done in a movie or in a comic book or in a game, we wouldn't have that same kind of reaction to it or interest, if you will, if yeah. you just purely design it. I, I was reading one in particular, and this is a game title, one of my favorites, and I'm just going to share it and drop it right now. Metal Gear. <laughs> so for those out there that are big Metal Gear fans, um, put it on the chat and uh, show me <laughs> show me who's out there. Uh, but there is there's a part where, hey, you know, big boss has to have an amputation done. It mm -hmm. tells you the story, the, the unraveling and um, not giving any spoilers. That's already something that has been already projected. And, and at this point, you should know <laughs> um, there's a mechanical arm in, in the mix and somebody saying, hey, I want that mechanical arm. <laughs> thinking this is the coolest thing and I could either look at this as you know the end all be all or I can still move forward and you know in, in a sense kind of geek out nerd out and also know that there's functionality attached to this uh, prosthetic and and just thinking a little bit too if you don't mind taking us back like the whole process of creating you know a prosthetic to make sure that it functions I'm sure it's not one size fits all. Um, if you don't mind. Yeah. 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 Like, like yeah, you're yeah. immediately just not. nodding your head. Like Ruben, you have no idea what goes on. And, and true. I, I, I'd like to learn more, especially for those that are out there that are probably thinking the same thing. Um, if, if you don't mind sharing us maybe a little bit of that evolution process that it takes to actually build, you know, a, yeah. a, a customized function prosthetic. Yeah, so there are a few different ways that you can do it, but I'm going to talk about the most common one. Um, so usually you'll have the patient come into your office and then you have to cast their limb or what we mm -hmm. call their residual limb after an amputation. Yeah. Um, so they come in, we use like a plaster bandage that you just get wet and then you just wrap it around their limb and you work all the air bubbles out. And then when you take it off, you have a negative model i guess <laughs> like yeah. just you know an empty cast like yeah. if you if you've had a cast on your leg in at, or anywhere on your body at any point in time that's exactly what i'm talking about you just make a cast of that part of your body right. um so then from there we take that and then we pour liquid plaster into it mm -hmm. so we end up getting a positive mold of that person's residual limb so if we're talking about let's just talk about the arm just for simplicity right. um so we would let's say that I was missing my arm here. We just cast all the way up above the elbow. Mm -hmm. And then we'd fill all of that with liquid plaster that ends up setting off. It gets really hard. And then we just take the outside cast off. Mm -hmm. So then you have a duplicate of this person's arm. And then that's when we as prosthetists goes, go in and we take down plaster in certain areas so we can make sure that we have enough, um, we call it suspension, like tightness around the limb and in okay. the right areas. So it's not going to cause them any pain, but it's still going to hold on to their limb. So if somebody's wearing, if somebody's wearing, um, let's just say one of those robotic arms, since everybody kind of knows what that looks like. If somebody's wearing one of those, if it's made properly, and if you go up and pull on their arm, it should not come off because okay. it should have that proper suspension. God. Should. <laughs> yeah, should, right. <laughs> So true. Um, yeah. So that's kind of like that's the same thing for legs too. So if somebody's missing a leg, we still cast whatever limb that they have left, and then we just do different kind of modifications. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, um, depending on what material you're using, we can pull some plastic over it. So we put plastic, hard plastic, in an oven, mm -hmm. and then leave it in there for about 20 minutes, um, and it becomes extremely pliable. And then you can just pour, pull it right over the mold of that person's limb. And that will create the device that will go onto their limb. So we usually make what we call test sockets to make sure that we, we're, it's fitting correctly before we go back and we do the definitive one, which is made out of carbon fiber or fiberglass wow. or Kevlar, which is really heavy duty. Yeah, I was just going to say Kevlar. Gosh, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So... Gosh, you explained it so well. So 
Laura, like how long does a process like that take? If you're talking about an in-clinic, I think you're looking at maybe maybe a month depending okay. it all depends on how many patients they have coming in if, right, right. if somebody okay for our uh projects that we do in school um yep. we usually have somebody come in we cast them and then i think they come back usually a week later okay and then we can fit them with the device oh wow but I that's mean, also in class so it's kind of different <laughs> right 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 i'm sure it, it's so about that time frame and so and you know even just understanding like some of that that we're currently doing now, um, especially even in a learning environment, you know, ha has the, like, what have you noticed that has been big improvements in the technologies that you see today and where you foresee going in the future? So the, the newest stuff coming out are um, myoelectric components, okay. which I think I talked to you briefly about a little bit the other day. Mm -hmm. So they're basically electrodes that you put onto different muscle bellies. And when I say muscle bellies, I'm talking about like the big ones. So you can see like this muscle belly. And then you have like muscle belly. <laughs> Love it. Muscle belly. But it's basically there is that muscle under that muscle. belly. <laughs> there is muscle somewhere in there. <laughs> it's there. It's there. I promise. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but they'll take um, different electrodes and they'll put it on the different parts of your muscle. So then whenever you contract that muscle, then yeah. it'll make the hand do whatever it's supposed to be doing. So, um, right. it doesn't even have to be in your, like, if you're talking about your arm, the electrodes are most likely going to be one here and then one here. Okay. So if I tell you to open your hand, then they might have to flex their arm to make that happen. Um, it all kind of depends on how you program it as well. But, um, very cool. Yeah. So that's so, definitely where it's going, but it doesn't have to necessarily be controlled by a part of your body that is nearby. For example, I just um, yeah. I just looked up another, um, somebody made this, I was the coolest thing. Somebody made this tentacle arm for this woman no that actually works. It's probably, I don't, I don't know how long it is. If she put it, if she put her arm down by her side, I think the tentacle would probably touch the ground. <laughs> no way. <laughs> but they actually ended up taking electrodes and did routing through her shirt all the way down to her big toes. So whenever she moved her big toes and depending on which one, she could actually make the tentacle actually wrap around things and actually grab things. Oh my Which, goodness. Super cool. That, that's, so that's, I, I feel like that's where we're going. The only, the only problem, and I always hate to bring this up, but the only problem is insurance coverage. Right, right. Insurance going to cover it? Probably not. Right, Sometimes, right. yes. So a lot of stuff comes out of pocket, which is why a lot of people don't go for those devices as often. Right. Right. And gosh, that's amazing. First of all, like how to think so outside the box, right. And just to think, Hey, mm -hmm. you know what, if I lost something, I'm going to gain, but I'm going to gain more. Right, <laughs> I'm not exactly. going to settle. I'm not going to settle for just a replacement. I'm going to just <laughs> go all out. I'm going to get what I want. <laughs> I'm going to get what I want. And this is my chance. And how we say loosely, like, you know, I don't have, you know, you know, forearms or, or anything like that to multitask even more. Well, you could if, if you desire it now with the technology that's out right. there. And um, I think that definitely also go, going back to gaming, I feel like a lot yeah. of those kind of concepts usually comes from gaming because mm. these creators come up with all these really unique characters with different kind of appendages and who knows what, like you never know what's going to come up. So I feel like there's a, a cool transition from the gaming field and what those creators come up with and then somebody's like wait but i can actually possibly make that in real life so let me try it <laughs> yeah yeah the imagination runs wild and exactly yeah definitely and, and I, I see that being the case too the the inspiration source is really there mm -hmm. and um and then trying to come into fruition right it, it's going to be a you know a lot of testing and development uh so that way it can be actually uh, prototyped out and, and to actually put it on someone uh, mm -hmm. to, to use. But that's amazing. So from what I'm hearing, though, from where the technology is going forward, it sounds like response time was is going to be as precise as it, if it was normal, if you quote unquote. Right. That's what we try. That's what we're trying to get towards. Absolutely. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. So that's really that, that, that gap analysis, if we, if we will, if we had to create one, that's really the, the key thing is uh, right. let's get them back. And that response is basically diminishing more and more as we push forward with the developments. Great. Mm -hmm. Gosh, amazing. Uh, it's so fascinating, honestly, what you're doing, Laura, and, and how you explain it too. Um, and so have you had any pay? I mean, this is now a question you personally having encounters, uh, with anybody with a prosthetic that is really built for more aesthetic looks and maybe some of the functionalities that attribute to that. Yeah. So if usually if you're getting something that's more, if you want something that's really highly realistic, it's mm -hmm. usually not going to have a lot of function to it. Mm -hmm. Um, because it'll just be an empty silicone tube basically yeah. that has all the painting on it to make it look like your other arm. Gotcha. Um, now they do make, if, if we go back to the robotic arms, um, they do make what they call cosmetic covers, which is exactly that. It's a cover to go over the fingers to make it look like a hand. It makes it look like flesh. Right. Um, they do make some very realistic ones, but from those, people typically go for um, ones that are closer to their skin color, but not necessarily hyper-realistic because they're more worried about the function of being able to actually grab things rather than worrying too much about it being extremely realistic looking. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, makes total sense. And, and, and aside from trauma, what have you noticed has also been, um, you know, other causes that has led to you know, amputations? The, yeah, the most ones are trauma. Um, diabetes is a huge one. That's, that's the biggest for lower limb amputations. It usually starts with a toe or a couple toes. And then if they don't change their habits, then unfortunately just keeps getting more and more further up the leg. It just keeps getting amputated higher and higher up the leg. Um, so trauma, diabetes, cancer is also a really large one. Um, and then the other main one is what we can, what we call, um, congenital birth defects. So somebody might be born without, uh, so you have two, two leg or two, uh, bones in your leg. You have your yeah. tibia and your fibula. Sometimes yeah. maybe they're not born with a fibula. So oh. they only have the tibia and they have to have some kind of device to help them ambulate. Or right. walk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. Thank you for sharing that. And, and uh, so true that, uh, th you know, from what you've seen, you know, where we're at, given that the technology is moving towards that um, aim of response time, uh, ha have you noticed like just a higher rise? And I mean, I hate to say it, but like uh, more people needing um, more amputations that are needing prosthetics. Have you seen just a growth overall? What, what is it that you've seen, if you don't mind sharing? Um, I haven't seen, I've, I've been doing a lot of shadowing and stuff, but I, of course, haven't seen my own patients yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know we learned about in school, I'm pretty sure amputations are going up just because of the, the how, much, how many people have diabetes in oh. the United States specifically. That is definitely a main contributor. Um, so yes, I would say amputations are going up, but we still have a lot of options for those people as well. Mm. So it's not, I feel like it's not as detrimental. Of course, losing an arm or a leg is still not good by any means. Like right. that's still going to drastically change your life, but we definitely have more advances. And let's say back in 1900, when we right, didn't have right. all the technology and yeah, we didn't really know how things fit people that well. So it would work, but it just didn't work as well as where we are now. Right. Right. No, no, thank you for sharing that. And, and um, I, I, again, that, that, that's a good point and it has a lot to do with the health and wellness side of, Hey, let's, mm -hmm. let's educate more people about, you know, what it is that we're noticing that are causing a lot of these damages or, you know, these risks to the body or, or any part, um, what can we do to prevent, right? It's usually exactly. the, the best medicine. Um, I'll yep. take a prevention note any day uh, <laughs> uh, from yeah. any doctor. The hard, the hard thing with diabetes is um, this is a purely 
my opinion, I don't have a lot of science to back this up, but I, I, I do believe that when somebody has type two diabetes specifically, I do believe there's a chemical imbalance in the brain. And mm. I think that that makes it kind of, kind of similar to a mental illness because we've been told in class many times that if we ever have a diabetic patient come in, we, when you're teaching them how to wear their, their new leg and how to clean it and how to clean their skin, um, they tell us that you have to verbally tell them, you have to give them a handout, you need to have them do it in front of you to make sure that they really, really, really grasp that concept. So I, I, yeah, I'm all about educating, but I think that there is something a little bit deeper to where I think it, it needs to go further than just educating. I feel like we need to do a little bit more research into if there is some kind of mental mm. shift that happens when you do get diagnosed with type two diabetes. Gosh, uh, thank you for sharing. Yeah, that, that's so true. And, and, and that's why research and study, you know, never ends, right, is to see where those relationships are, where are those uh, meeting at those points and see if we can explore a little bit more with some uh, with some data backed up with it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's awesome that in a sense that there is a routine of, yeah, thinking about the hygiene aspect of it, too you're going to have to take care of it, like a maintenance, right? Yep. Just um, like your own body. Like Just like your own body. I was just going to say that. <laughs> uh, just like everything else too, that we have to run and manage. Um, you know, our body is essentially that we have to manage it and, and you know, take care of it as well. Um, so uh, I, again, so the neat things that you're doing, obviously, and what you're studying, finding that space in gaming, seeing where those relationship really ties into, hey, there's a lot of now uh, room for that aesthetic steps because we have moved more so into that response time, um, you know, perfecting. Well, yeah, in, in, in a sense, we're perfecting the technology to make it always um, highly, you know, uh, you know, more forward advanced thinking of, hey, this is going to work for a person that is in the state so that we can honestly not only get to the functionality and getting them where they need to be and being the light that you guys are all are, um, but helping them prepare with that mental step, right? It's to say, hey, look, there are more people out there that have gone through some of this trauma, maybe even the same or different, and other aspects too that lead into to what you just shared that will allow you to feel that you can go back you can actually go back doing what it is that you love to do. And if some of that is gaming, great. You have that ability and now more so because of the aesthetics that are out there to, to you know, compose and ease the mind um, a little bit. Um, what, what is it that you'd like to share a little bit more, Laura, if, as we're ideating a little bit more based off what you're doing in your field for others out there that are, are highly interested or just even thinking, hey, this is really... Um, powerful work that you're doing um, to help people. Yeah, I kind of want to go back um, to the very last thing that you said. Um, if anybody is listening who does have any kind of amputation, or if you know somebody who has one, if they ever complain about something of like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Mm. If you ever have to say, I can't do this, that's something that you need to talk to your prosthetist about, because we might not be able to make you be, do absolutely everything but we're kind of like known as the widget makers we're kind of the people in the back who come up with really weird ways to do stuff like really we come up with all creative things to fix problems so we are the problem solvers so yeah. if you have a problem like definitely just talk to your clinician and just say hey I'd really like to get back into running but I don't have a leg to do that like because there are different kinds of legs for different activities right. Disclose. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, just, I would just say, be upfront, be honest. If you, if you are missing a hand or something and you want to get back into gaming, but you feel like your current device isn't doing what it needs to be doing, then just be very open with that and say, this is what I want to do. And this is what I can't do because of this. And then we can try to piece everything together. And I mean, they come up with so many different things. I mean, they have different, um, feet for um for like rock climbing mm. they have different hand pieces for rock climbing 
um, ski, they have different stuff for skiing and like every kind of sport you can imagine. Um, also in gaming, depending on what you're playing, what you're after. I don't know a lot of the devices that are out for gaming, but that's another thing. Like gaming hasn't always been prevalent. I remember, you know, I was yeah. born back in 1994 and, <laughs> and I remember, you know, playing, playing a minesweeper on my computer oh my when gosh, I yes. have internet yet. <laughs> so gaming is relatively, I mean, if you look at the course of history, gaming is yeah. really, really, really new. Yeah. Um, so we probably haven't even explored that realm because it's new and we haven't had anything to base anything off of. So if that's a, that's a challenge that we would love to come up with, you know, oh, I want to be able to do this, but I, I need this kind of movement. Uh, well, try to come up with something that will, that will work for you in your favor. Gosh, Laura, that's, that's awesome. First of all, I, for all the, I'm going to pause and say for all those publishers listening, those who are creating a game, you know, <laughs> we're, we're, oh, I'm sure they're always thinking about their audience. Hey, maybe that's an audience to think about. Maybe that's the new direction that will open up a series of really good questions to really solve problems that, hey, it gives opportunity for those to actually work on. Um, you know, you've got great widget makers. <laughs> I, I love that you said that. I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. In my mind, I was thinking, gosh, like a blacksmith forging like a new <laughs> kind of line of sharp weapon. And I'm tying it back to games a little bit thinking, Hey, this is going to be stronger than before. Um, and, and such a good point. And just again, to reiterate, that's so true. If you are out there and you need some kind of help, we got to seek it. You know, it, it can't come from just somebody spectating it from afar. Um, you know, it, it does take that courage to, to share. But um, really neat, really neat, Laura. I mean, I, I'm excited for the possibilities. And it's so true. I mean, even just researching some of the, um, you know, the gaming console manufacturers that are out there, some of them that are creating some of these uh, controllers that are very conducive to um, those that are in, uh, you know, that need special attention or, or dealing with a disability. Uh, those are all great. I, I think we need to keep advancing those notions and see what it is that it looks like now for somebody that has taken that extra step to receive a prosthetic and think, hey, you know what? Uh, maybe I'm into VR <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I, I want to do something really neat where I have to hold a certain controller a certain way and be able to do the movement, um, you know, to, to get to that level that you know, that proceeds, but, um, yeah, there very are a interesting lot of different possibilities out there. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, it, it, it scratches the surface and it's so true. Um, there hasn't been like full on immersion of it. It's, it's like, it starts, you know, the research component and understanding what that is and what right. the system currently has, but it just goes to show, um, there are things of that nature that might be worth exploring if we keep asking those questions and uh, right. seeing what those problems are and, and, and really face them. Um, mm -hmm. How cool. Well, gosh, Laura, we're, we're getting to that point um, where, uh, you know, we're, we're coming to our end. And this is where I ask every guest that comes in uh, to share with us some, some words of wisdom, if you don't mind, uh, to our community that's listening. Words of wisdom. Is that just <laughs> open to my interpretation? <laughs> It, it, it is. It is. It's honestly something good that you want to leave everyone. Uh, hopefully keep it warm and fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. So I guess my words of wisdom, if you're wanting to get into prosthetics and orthotics, um, call different places. I mean, you can just go to Yelp or Google prosthetics and orthotics and it'll come up with different places that you can go to. Just give them a call, say, hey, I'm really interested in possibly getting into your field. Can I go shadow you for, for a day or for a morning or for an hour if you really want to? Um, most places are very accepting of having students just come in and just follow them around because, again, we enjoy teaching. We enjoy talking about our profession because it's a really, really, really small profession. Mm -hmm. So when somebody says, oh, I'm really interested in that, we just spew out lots of words <laughs> and we love to show why we're here and what we do um and if you do want to pursue it further on 
you might have to make a move. And honestly, it is absolutely worth the move. You can always move back to your family. If you do have to move away for school, you can always move back to your family afterwards because prosthetics and orthotics are needed absolutely everywhere in the nation. So just do what you want to do. Don't be afraid to do what you want to do. It is scary. I was absolutely terrified when I got my acceptance letter. So happy, but also terrified at the same time. That's a very normal feeling. So just, I guess, just do what makes you happy. Go find that thing that makes you happy and then just push the boundaries of what you're doing. That's, that's my goal in prosthetics. I'm having a bunch of uh, interviews right now for residencies. And that's what they keep asking me is, you know, how are you, how, what, what's something new that you're going to bring to the table? And yeah. I'm always about pushing the boundaries. Oh, they say that I can't do that. Well, why can't I do that? Let's right. try doing it. And then we're going to find the holes and we'll just patch those holes. Let's figure out a way to make this work. Gosh. So, so go after what you want. <laughs> no, love it, Laura. Thank you. And it's so good again, you know, especially at any time, you know what I mean? Whether we're ending the year or beginning the year or it's the middle of the year, it doesn't matter. It, these are all great uh, words that you just shared. And it's so true. And, and honestly, Laura, I, I wish you all the best. I think you're going to do amazing things. Um, and just can't thank you enough for coming to our program and to ideate with us um, and what it is that you're doing in your field how you've immersed yourself into the gaming aspect, how this could help essentially um, bring in uh, a lot of different ways and how it really, you know, allows the work that you're doing to become one of those things where it's an easier process from patient to orthotist. And I don't know if I said that right or not, but <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. <laughs> I had to think for a second <laughs> um, uh, a on that one. Letters that come together. <laughs> Thank you. And I don't, and you have all permission to stop me there and to make sure I slow down. Um, <laughs> but it, it's so, you know, relevant to how, you know, what it is that people are interested in naturally engage, why they actually do it in the first place to help them in the process um, outside of what it is that they like to do, even getting to them what they, you know, have a trade in or skill in because this is for work uh, purposes to get them out there and to honestly just, just feel like you're back to normal and hopefully even stronger from that, not just normal, but mm -hmm. yeah, let's take you to that step and then catapult you into, let's just feel even better now that we are in this new stage. Yeah, um, absolutely. Excellent. Well, can't thank you enough. Um, thank you all to that tuned in, um, you know, today to our session. And again, if you miss any of this stuff, this could also be found in our YouTube channel um, archived and you can just simply uh, search in our playlist and you can definitely check out the session there. Well, um, for everyone else, have a great rest of your day and hopefully this was uh, helpful and informative and we'll keep at it. All right, take care everybody.